In this video, we'll study the noise in common source and cascode gain stages. We'll begin by just reviewing the noise analysis of the common source amplifier. We consider the case shown here with an NMOS common source transistor Q1 in active mode and Q2 serving as a load and biased in triode that's gate pulled down to ground. So you may recall that there were two uh, noise contributors that we considered when we did this analysis. We assumed that the amplifier was quite broadband so that thermal noise is dominant and we therefore neglect um, flicker noise, one over F noise, and we therefore need to focus on the thermal noise of Q2 in triode and the thermal noise of Q1 in active mode, each of which are modeled by these noise current sources having white power spectral density. Uh, we also want to include in our analysis the output capacitance, CO. Without including some capacitances, then the uh, bandwidth of the thermal noise would be infinite, and we'd end up seeing infinite uh, noise at the output. So just a reminder that we analyze each of these in turn, and uh, they, they give rise to two terms in the final expression for output noise. First, we've got the noise due to transistor Q1. So that appears as the terms uh, identifying here in green. Uh, and we do the analysis first neglecting the other noise source due to Q2 entirely. Then we do the analysis a second time neglecting IN1 and including only the noise source IN2 due to thermal noise of Q2. And that gives rise to the second term, which in the second expression is all factored out. Just a reminder, these total integrated noise values at the output can be found by multiplying the white noise spectral density at the output by the noise equivalent bandwidth, which is equal to, in this case, assuming a 3 dB, uh, uh, sorry, assuming a first order response. low pass, of course, then it's simply the bandwidth of that first order low pass response times pi by two. That's the noise equivalent bandwidth. And so we can find the total integrated noise by multiplying the level of the white noise spectral density at the output by this uh, noise equivalent bandwidth. And in this case, um, the 3 dB bandwidth here is simply uh, uh, dominated by the output time constant R out times CO, CO including all parasitic capacitances at the output. And uh, right, we've got this, you know, maybe better to rewrite it like this. Okay, so that's how we arrive at these two terms shown here on the left. Um, and then noting that the bracketed term um, over here uh, has two components. One is gamma, which is uh, a value of a, a constant that's uh, two thirds for long channels and higher for sh very short channel length devices. Whereas the second term is one over GM times RDS two. So that, uh, by the way, just to be clear, oops, GM we're using in these expressions is GM of the signal path transistor GM one. Um, so that term, therefore, is the second term in the brackets is approximately the gain of the stage. In fact, it's slightly larger than the gain of the stage. And therefore, we assume that it's, the stage has, it has been designed to have some reasonable amount of gain greater than unity. So in that case, then uh, certainly the second term in the denominator is a lot smaller than the first term. And we can neglect it and therefore all we're left with really is the term arising due to Q1. So that tells us that the uh, noise observed at the output of the stage is dominated by Q1. And uh, again, we've neglected flicker noise, assuming it's a pretty wide bandwidth. Um, 
So we've really just got this thermal noise term at the output. So that's uh, a nice, relatively simple expression that captures some interesting design trade-offs um, at play. Now this is the total RMS noise at the output, node V out. If we're interested in the input referred noise, we have to divide that by the amplifier small signal gain shown here. And uh, in fact, uh, we can take the RMS noise at the output squared, divide it by the gain of the stage squared. And um, by doing so, you see that the output noise has the gain GM R out in the numerator, but because um, we're dividing by the gain squared, we're getting uh, the gain term show up instead in the numerator for the input referred noise. So this um, kind of raises an interesting question because we see the exp an expression for output noise, gain, GM, and really the gain of the whole stage appears in the numerator, whereas in the expression for input referred noise, GM of Q1 and in fact the gain of the whole amplifier appears in the denominator. So if we want to design this stage for low noise, should we design it to have a large GM or a small GM? And so the thing to recognize here is that um, for this stage, if you, if you double the transconductance Q1, you will be increasing the output noise spectral density arising due to its thermal noise, IN1. But you'll be increasing the gain of the stage by even more. So um, if you're thinking about a small signal applied at the input and you want to preserve that signal and put, corrupt it with noise as little as possible, we're better off having a large gain. We'll get a little bit more noise at the output, but we'll get a lot more signal. So overall, the signal at the output will have higher fidelity. And it's the input referred noise that gives us that intuition. <coughs> <laughs> Finally, just a reminder that we obtained this input referred noise value in sort of millivolts or microvolts or RMS by looking at the total integrated output noise and dividing by the low frequency gain AV rather than by integrating the input referred noise spectral density, which would in fact be white. Next, let's consider the noise analysis of this cascode amplifier. Now, it turns out that the impact of the thermal noise of Q1 is the same as in the common source stage. Again, we would analyze the circuit due to the thermal noise of Q1, just as we did on the last slide with all other noise sources turned off. And um, there'd be no difference here since with respect to this injected noise current, Q2 would essentially just pass the current right to the output node where it would see the output impedance R out uh, in parallel with C out, which we're C O, which we're assuming is still here, if nothing else due to parasitics of the transistors in the amplifier itself. So we would see a very, a very similar looking analysis for the noise contribution of Q1. Its output noise would be uh, as shown here. This is V N1 out. RMS squared. And so therefore, the input referred noise due to transistor Q1 squared would just be as before KT gamma over GM R out CO because we divide by the gain of the stage squared. Now, second, let's consider the impact uh, due to Q2. So Q2 is cascode transistor biased in active mode, as you know. So let's um, think about this thermal noise current source here, I N2. And um, so I, it, in fact, the thermal noise of Q2 has very little impact on the noise at the output of the circuit. And that's maybe a little bit non-intuitive at first, I think one way to make it intuitive is um, to think about what happens if we you know, redraw this part of the circuit in uh, a kind of equivalent format. So we can take 
any current source, whether it's a small noise current, uh, whether it's modeling small noise current, or it's an independent source, whatever it is, and we can always split up a current source like this as two current sources. Oops, let's try this. Let's say, two identical current sources in series. Shouldn't be hard to convince you that this is exactly the same as a single current source with a value of IN2. Now, having done so, we've got created this fictitious node here between the two current sources. And these being ideal current sources, they will source that value of current regardless of the voltage across them. Hence, we can kind of assume that the intermediate voltage at this fictitious node is really any value that we choose. Um, and it won't change the analysis. So we can arbitrarily assume that that voltage is at ground. Uh, again, it shouldn't affect the analysis. Uh, it won't affect the analysis at all to do so. So now that we've divided up um, or redrawn this part of the circuit in this way, let me just go one step further here and redraw it one more time. And um, really highlight the fact that these current sources are now grounded. Okay. Now we're considering still in this, we've just created an equivalent schematic here where we're considering only the thermal noise of Q2. We have already separately analyzed the thermal noise of Q1, so we don't need to include it here. Um, but you know, you see here that um, the if we focus on this current source here, it looks just like the small signal current that's coming from Q1. And as we know, that current uh, flows, you know, into the source of Q2 by and large as long as the impedance connected up here in the drain of Q2 is not uh, too large, then all of that current IN1 is going to flow this way. But in this same schematic, we are, you know, um, drawing this, this current down here. Sorry, I made a slight mistake. I should have flipped this current source around when I redrew the schematic because it's the it's this terminal of that current source that's connected to ground, right? So uh, keeping the polarity the same, right? We we see that the current just flows from IN2 just flows up into Q2 and then gets pulled back down through here. So it does not flow through the resistance, the output impedance R out. Or, or anything else, it doesn't create any voltage drop at the output. So the output voltage essentially doesn't, doesn't move in response to this noise current IN2. Now I just wanna, you know, if, if, you're, if there's any part of this analysis that you're a little uncomfortable with, let me try and kind of uh, address it here. You might say, well, you've got two noise currents, IN, both labeled IN2 here, but you're analyzing them together. Since they're noise currents, shouldn't you analyze them separately? The answer is no. We analyze two noise currents separately when they are independent noise sources. For example, when they arise due to two separate devices in the circuit, the noise of Q1 is uncorrelated with the noise of Q2. Their thermal noise, it turns out, is highly uncorrelated, even if these two transistors are right next to each other. So um, therefore, we need to analyze them separately and superimpose them with a, in a root sum of squares fashion. But in this case, we're not actually modeling the noise from two separate devices. We've just taken the noise from a single device, Q2 over here, and we've, we've just uh, split the analysis up into two equivalent current sources. But in order to maintain the equivalence as we went from the left schematic over to the right schematic, we all, at every step, we had to assume that these two current sources uh, both have the exact same 
value at all points in time, I n2. Otherwise, we can't draw make this equivalent. So these two current sources that we ended up with here, I n2, they're not uncorrelated. They're actually identical to each other. They're perfectly correlated. So therefore, we do the analysis this way. And when we, when we do so, we see that the current from this bottom source flows all the way through the through Q2 and out through the second current source. It doesn't it doesn't flow through R out. It doesn't flow through ZD2 or anything like that. It creates no voltage drop at V out. So all of this is one uh, sort of way to analyze the circuit and recognize that Q2 has no noise contribution at the output. So this is a really interesting um, cool fact is that you can uh, introduce a cascode transistor into an amplifier, it gets you more gain at the cost of some output swing, and it does not, in fact, have much impact on the stage's noise. Now, if you had trouble following through all the simplifications that uh, were made here, you can also do the analysis just from scratch using the schematic on the far left, and you should find, if you do so properly, you should find the same result. And again, just a reminder that the one little assumption that was made here is that ZD2 whatever impedance is connected at the output is not so much greater than um, the output impedance uh, of the cascode stage, which is a sort of a GM times an RDS squared, remember. So, um, and that would be the case if the active load represented by this bias current here is either a simple current mirror and therefore with an open impedance of just an RDS. It, it would also be the case even if my bias is realized as a cascode current mirror, in which case it would seem to have an output resistance that's comparable to GM RDS squared. Um, and that, that would, you know, you, that might suggest that we're going to not, not satisfy this, this condition over here. But as soon as you consider any output capacitance, that will contribute at high frequencies to the output impedance uh, connected in the drain of Q2, ZD2, and will reduce it so that even if at DC this condition is not true, perhaps over as soon as you get up to any reasonable frequency, over a wide range of frequencies, the condition is, is satisfied thanks to the output load of, of CO. Um, so, right, so as long as that condition is maintained, then you know, you get this result that the output noise is unaffected by Q2. Hence, as a result, the main takeaway point here is that the noise performance of the cascode stage is still generally dominated by the transistor Q1.